All right. Hello. Day is almost over. So I'm Dirk Albon. I'm the CEO of Hyperloop Transportation Technologies. And um, well, we're transforming transportation at the speed of sound, literally. So Hyperloop Transportation Technologies is building the Hyperloop. But who here actually knows what the Hyperloop really is? Right. I'm going to test you guys later. So for everybody else, we have a little video here that shows how it all started, where we are now, and where we're going. Enjoy. America has always been a nation of doers. We build things. We take risks. And we believe that if you have a good idea and are willing to work hard enough, you can turn that idea into a successful business. Billionaire philanthropist Elon Musk has hinted at a new high-speed transport system that could put planes and trains out of business. I have a name for it, name for it, which is called the Hyperloop. So what's Hyperloop? Mr. Musk's plan? Move people using a massive vacuum tube combined with a magnetic levitation system. Kind of like a Jetsons tunnel? It's something like that, yeah. Here's how he teased the idea in May at an All Things D conference. It's a cross between a Concorde and a railgun. It's called the Hyperloop. It's a system of giant suspended tubes. Riding within are capsules carrying people or freight traveling on cushions of air at speeds of up to 1,200 k's per hour, or roughly one kilometer every three seconds. A tube that would be on pillars from Los Angeles to San Francisco, and inside there would be capsule cars that would be rocketed forward up to 700 miles an hour, and that there would be a fan on the front. Elon Musk basically says that this is the way of the future. How would you like something that uh, can never crash, mm -hmm. um, it is immune to weather, it goes uh, three or four times faster than the, the, the sort of bullet train, and it would cost you uh, much less um, than, than an air ticket. It will only cost to build this six or seven billion dollars. Oh. Compare that to the 65 billion for the current high-speed rail plans for California. He believes this is a viable, valuable alternative for mass transit between these two destinations. Could something like the Hyperloop actually be the answer to super fast, environmentally friendly, high speed travel between our busiest cities? So the gauntlet has been thrown down. A design document for a whole new super cool way to travel. The only thing now, will someone pick it up and make the Hyperloop a reality? There are some companies that, have, that are forming to try to make the Hyperloop happen and uh, I, encourage them. I think that's, that's great. Um, I'm super focused on Tesla and SpaceX and to, to you know, a small amount on Solar City. so that, that basically completely uses up my, my brain. Tesla founder Elon Musk proposed this new technology called Hyperloop and it's being developed right now in Playa Vista here in this hangar behind me. The only resistance would be the air in front of the capsule which uh, we move to the back by using a compressor. Hyperloop has teamed up with the students to create this tube technology that's designed to connect cities up to 400 miles apart. Dirk Alborn says it's safer and more efficient than the railroad. Well, the system is complete, completely computerized. So um, you, know, you optimize the system and then you actually have the humans to monitor it. In railroads, most accidents were all human factors. Plus, a lot of the derailments are actually happened because something's on the track. So we're in a closed system. We're completely managed by a computer system. There's no human factor that can actually create those issues. We actually plan on uh, seeing the first Hyperloop very, very soon starting. Can you imagine uh, and walk us through what it might be like to travel at the speed of sound? It's not going to be much different than uh, sitting in an airplane, actually. Obviously, for us, it's very important to make it as good of an experience as possible. So This is an independent organization that has formed. We have 170 engineers, scientists, and uh, really great professionals with amazing backgrounds. The race is on. Elon Musk's vision for a high-speed passenger pods, known as the Hyperloop, is one step closer to becoming reality this morning. One of the known companies competing to capitalize on Musk's proposal announcing today it has struck a deal with landowners in Central California to build the first full-scale Hyperloop along a five-mile stretch along I-5, with construction set to begin in 2016. Let's bring in Dirk Alburn, who is the man who runs the Hyperloop Transportation Technologies team, which is announcing this deal with Quay Valley, California. 
Uh, Dirk, tell me about this deal and, and really when you expect this Hyperloop, this five-mile stretch to be finished. Quay Valley is supposed to be breaking ground um, beginning of 2016. That's um, when we will be start um, working on our development. So we will be starting ground uh, at the same time. Uh, we, at this moment, we expect to be done by 2018. Hyperloop now appears one step closer to reality. Starting next year, that theory will turn into a groundbreaking in Quay Valley, Kings County off of I-5. A developer there has just committed a big chunk of his private land toward the project. It's a five-mile loop that would take visitors through a planned entertainment district. There's going to be a test track. Elon Musk has announced that he's going to build a small-scale test track. It's a necessary step for us to be building a full-scale version. And um, Quay Valley is a sustainable model town of the 21st century, so it's a perfect fit. They're expecting over 10 million uh, visitors per year, so we will actually be able to re generate revenues very, very fast. The company plans to go public later this year. We want to do a public offering. We want to give the, uh, our community that's supporting us the possibility to own parts of, uh, of the company. We want to make sure that um, the people that have been helping building um, the company and this technology are able to um, participate in, in, in the investment in the fundraising and the upside of the company. With their contributions to Hyperloop, these students from around the world now have stock options in the company, but they say they're not in it for the money. As a student, I start to feel like um, I'm in a in part of a, some great career that might turn to work. Will the Hyperloop kill the railroad? The so Hyperloop is going to do to the U.S. what the railroads did in the 1800s. So um, it will change the way we live. It's possible today. It's based on existing technologies. And it's the right time. It's the right moment to finally get something doing like this. Is it visionary? In 30 years' time, <laughs> will you and I be sitting on our rocking chairs going, well, we talked about it then, and he did it. So you think this is possible? This is not just... Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. For all those who said this is just a neat little thing <laughs> to draw on a cocktail napkin, these guys are saying it will become reality. All right. So those were basically two and a half years put together in a couple of minutes, um, just showing you a little bit of the overview. So to reiterate, what is the Hyperloop? So imagine a capsule filled with people hovering inside a tube, okay, and um, going really, really fast from point A to point B. The capsule doesn't touch anywhere. It's levitating. We're using a passive magnetic levitation system, which is uh, the safest you can choose. It's basically a technology that was developed by one of the national research labs in America, and uh, it makes the capsule levitate through motion, so there's no energy involved. We just announced a couple of uh, days ago a new material that we developed. Again, for safety, safety is one of the most important things because you're inside uh, a low pressure environment. So we have developed a composite material that's smart, that can detect pressure, integrity of the material overall, it's um, made in um, a double sandwich panel, and the whole pot is basically constructed from this material. So this has the advantage that in case that one of the skins is damaged, we know that, but you're still safe because the interior, very likely skin, is still completely intact and keeps you basically inside the pressured vessel. Inside the tube, we create a low-pressure environment, which basically means we take all the air out. So that the capsule, very similar to an airplane that goes into high altitudes, can travel very fast with very little energy because it doesn't encounter any resistance. The whole system is on pylons, which has advantage that we don't have to buy all the land. We just have to buy the land where the pylons are. If you are the landowner, you will very much like this because you still can get from one side to the other. We can also integrate the latest um, earthquake technology, something actually fairly important in California. Capacity is something that um, we ask often. Well, one tube basically can substitute air travel between Los Angeles to San Francisco five times. 
we have two. But if that would one day not be enough, we actually over-engineer the pylon so that we can add on tubes. So this is a very early concept, but it just shows that we, can, we are able to create more capacity. This is probably the most important aspect of the system. It's completely green. And it's not that it's important because it's green, but it's important because it's part of the business. So we are using solar, wind, kinetic energy through regenerative braking, and in some cases, even geothermal, to produce more energy than we're using. Why is this so important? Well, our operational costs are very, very low. So on something like Los Angeles to San Francisco, we would be able to be profitable within eight years with a $30 ticket price in economy. This is actually something revolutionary. There's no rail line, no metro line in the world that's profitable. And I get to that a little bit later. But why should we do this? This is why. Traffic. One of the worst things humanity has ever invented, I guess. We spend a lot of time in traffic, time we could be productive, or more importantly, actually, time that we could spend with the people that we love. In fact, based on where we live, we decide where we work. Based on where we live, we decide who we date. Because if she lives on the other side of the city, it probably is not going to work out. Then there's this. Traveling sucks. It's not an experience anymore. It used to be something fun, so I heard. But I mean, I'm in an airport really a lot, and um, I don't enjoy it at all. But we can do better. This is another reason. Beijing on a sunny day. On a bad day, you can't see your hand in front of your face. But this is not just the problem that we have in Beijing or Mumbai. Pollution is a problem that we have everywhere. Actually, in Europe, on average, you are losing roughly 14 months of your life because of pollution. Think about that and think about what we should do about it. Now, obviously, traffic is only a part of it, but it is a part. And I personally feel we should do something about it. Then, as I said, the rail industry, actually a dinosaur industry, hasn't really invented anything or changed anything for the last, I would say, 100 years. Maglev, which is the latest technology, was invented in the 1930s in Germany. The first prototype was done in the 1970s. That's the state of the art. So we are building old infrastructure, very expensive, when we could build much more smarter systems that are cheaper. So let's just take a look at the rail and how we're building trains today. This is the standard measure on which we are building rail. Does anybody know why? Nope, the Roman carriage. So basically, our infrastructure is built based on the butts of two horses in 2016. But if we would actually take those and make them a little bit larger, we could transport more goods, go faster, and most importantly, safer. Actually, France and Spain have changed for the high-speed rail and made them larger. But in general, everywhere else, we're still building with the old systems. And then there's this. As I said earlier, there's no rail, no metro that's profitable. The Los Angeles metro, for an, as an example, makes 76 cents per passenger, and taxpayers are paying $2.50 for each person that takes the metro. Now, people can say, well, that's Los Angeles, and uh, people are using the car, that's true. But um, even in New York, we're losing money, $2.2 billion a year. Germany subsidizes their rail industry with $9 billion a year, and it's like that all over. 
everywhere. Now, every, every one of you who has ever taken a bus, a train, knows that they can improve. There are business models, there are services that you would like to, to see. So innovation can be the key here. So how would our lives be if we would have a Hyperloop? Well, one of the big problems we're having is airports. They're overflowing. We're building more airports. They're fairly close to the city as well. Now, with a Hyperloop, we could make them become terminals. We could build more airports further away, larger airports. Shipping, ports, actually very expensive real estate, could be outside in the ocean and un up unloaded in real time. We could live in one place and work in another. Live in one city, work in the other, or maybe even better, live 150, 200 kilometers away and be within 10 minutes in a city center. So in Los Angeles, for example, if you want to have a house where you don't risk to get shot every morning, you have to spend a million dollars. Now, real estate 150 miles away is much cheaper. You could live much nicer, but still be very connected. But how are we doing this? So we know we can build pylons. We know we can build tubes. We know we can create a vacuum inside a tube. So this is actually a picture of uh, the CERN Hadron Collider in Switzerland. Um, the company that's maintaining the vacuum is actually part of our team. And it's a much higher vacuum than what we need. As far as alternative energy, I think it's one of the best bets because it's actually only become cheaper and more efficient. Today, we are able in California with existing technology to cover all of our energy needs. So it looks very promising for the future. But we're doing one thing that's completely different. And I know here there's a lot of people, a lot of startups, a lot of entrepreneurs. So this is the part that I'm personally I'm most passionate about. I'm sure you all are familiar with these companies. Well, actually, I saw some people here are a little bit younger, so they might not know all of them. They all have something in common. They're all failures. Blackberry, I know, still around, but failure for me. Then there's these companies. They all have something in common as well. All of these companies, at one point of the history, had a problem and um, incorporated something called crowdsourcing. Lego, for example, was almost bankrupt. They switched the CEO. The new CEO incorporated crowdsourcing, and today it's one of the most successful toy companies out there. Some of these companies have more than 50% of the innovation coming from the outside. So normally when we talk about a train, a metro, it's done behind closed doors. You don't know anything. You hear they're planning something, it's going to cost this much, that's it. Well, we do something that we call crowdstorming. Crowdstorming, well, people can join the team, we ask questions, we want their ideas, their opinions, um, they're connecting us with other people, they're helping with tasks, and it's, I think, the questions that's uh, the most important, because you're really asking everything. You want to work with your community, with your customers, with the passengers, even the future passengers, you want to learn from them. And it's things like, do we need a ticket? And not only do we need a paper ticket, but is a ticket the best way to monetize? I personally think a ticket is 1800. In 2016, we can come up with a better way. We actually did some work together with MIT, and there's some really interesting studies, what we can do in the digital world already. Or things like, what are we going to do with the pylons? If I look at our cost, I see that there's billions of dollars that we spend for pylons. Well, if I tell you, I give you 200 pylons, what are you going to do with it? And it's only the question that then gives you some of the crazy ideas or some great ideas. Things like, let's use them as vertical garden or let's make them into beehives. Or actually, one thing that um, the technology that we found out that way was we're able to generate water out of air, air humidity, actually, by using the same components that we already have. So we're able to generate income. We can make them into charging stations. There's many, many ideas out there. 
It's all about questioning everything. It's about using the public, creating an ecosystem. So we don't really believe that we are the best. We believe that if we create an ecosystem, this ecosystem will actually innovate and continuously innovate, similar to your phone. Your phone is one thing, right? It's great technology, what, but what really makes your phone great are all the apps, all the companies that are on there. So what we are building is the infrastructure where you will be able to say, I want to go here, and then it connects with all the providers, and there's going to be a marketplace. And this mar in this marketplace, hopefully, there's going to be all the solutions for all the pain points that we ever had, or even some fun things, right? So we're doing a digital innovation challenge, which we, ju which we just announced in Bratislava, at the Bratislava airport, together with uh, Deutsche Bahn, the D-Lab from the Deutsche Bahn, and Lufthansa Innovation, and Amazon Web Services. So you're all invited on the 6th of July. And we hope to see a lot of great companies. But we're working a lot of passenger experience. So as an example, you're in a closed system. Right? You can't really look outside. You're inside a tube. But um, there is some technology that we can use to give you the feel like you're looking out of a window. We're using head tracking to move the image. We now can create content. Take a look. image in a way that you really have the feeling like you're looking outside of a window. Imagine driving through Jurassic World, Terminator Land, and now the transportation company actually can make money, and for you it's an amazing experience. We're creating a new market, con con experience content, right? But why should we do it this way? Well, actually it's not an Elon Musk idea. The idea of traveling inside a tube has been around for quite some time. O already in 1870, there was an attempt, the first New York subway was a pneumatic subway. Um, the plan was to connect New York to San Francisco. They were actually, they built a station and the first track. The first patent was in 1904 by Robert Goddard, one of the most well-known rocket scientists. In popular science in 1969, the Secretary of Transportation of the US said that tube travel would change the way Americans live, and they financed two prototypes. Well. Then there were these guys, the Jetsons. In Switzerland, they worked uh, in the 90s on a project called Swiss Metro. Same thing, tunnels under, underground, very large train. Actually, from a technology point of view, they came very, very fast. It just was fairly expensive. And obviously, if you're tied into one country, that's a problem. Then there were the Simpsons. And then there came Elon Musk. So, I was part of a nonprofit incubator that was uh, uh, funded by NASA, and we were working on a new way of building companies by bringing people together that have the same passion. So we reached out, we launched in the same time in beta, and um, we asked, can we put it on the platform? So we put it on the platform and asked the community, should we, should we be working on it? Not only did they say, yes, you should be doing this, but they said, hey, I want to be part of it. So we built, uh, incorporated the company, got a small team together, and um, yeah, told people apply if you want to work for stock options in exchange for your work, minimum of 10 hours a week. Got a team together of around 100 people, worked on the feasibility study, 
which we finished at the end of 2014. Today, the company is more than 520 people plus 40 companies. We're building a movement, not a company. As part of a movement, it's also that there's other companies now, there's other efforts that are trying to do this, which is great. Why am I telling you this? Well, first of all, I want you to join the right company, in case you want to. But also, I think it's very interesting to see how traditional ways are comparing to this new way of building a company. So as I said, 520 com uh, people. Actually, there's a little video, which unfortunately I'm running out of time, so I have to skip. But those are not just a couple of guys in the chat room. They're actually people that work at Apple, NASA, SpaceX, Boeing, dedicating their time and making this happen. We have five new applications every single day. But this sounds all great, right? When are we actually going to see this? You're probably surprised, but we already we got land. We filed the building permits. We will start construction later this year in Quay Valley, California. Quay Valley is a newly to be built model town of the 21st century. It's going to be an entertainment system, complete, uh, sorry, entertainment district, three resorts, a theme park, 10 million people. We also signed an agreement with the country of Slovakia. So the goal right now is to identify the best track in Bratislava with a vision to connect it between Vienna, Bratislava, and Budapest and uh, Bratislava. What I want to show you here is actually that you can do amazing things without having raising a lot of funds. All you have to do is you have to find people that are passionate about the same things, and you can get this far. Thank you. Thank you.